Okay, first up we have Christian Gull, who is on uh, my team. He works on HPC. So, hello all. I just want to talk shortly about my um, hacking project where I tried to use machine learning methods on the Bugzilla database. I wanted to do this because I also trying to uh, um, the package of TensorFlow and to get a grip of the package you have to really use it. And for machine learning you always need a proper data source and so that's the reason why I choose Bugzilla for that. Yeah, that's, I will shortly go over the TensorFlow installation, then um, what is in Bugzilla and what I use from Bugzilla, then I, how I grab the data from Bugzilla, and then my, the learning model, and that I did not find, uh, yeah, that I did not succeed, but let's go on. So you can install TensorFlow in sev uh, or software in general in several ways, especially TensorFlow and the machine learning packages are relatively often delivered as containers. Um, at the moment, we and also others s do not have really system packages which you can install directly. You always have to go either through something like pip, so this Python installer, or um, you can use a Docker container which is provided by TensorFlow or also other machine learning um, frameworks. The Docker advantage of course is just a single step, you run the container, but I will see the other disadvantages. There are the Docker disadvantages. For example, if you spin up the Docker container, you suddenly find out that the whole machine learning app is still Python 2, which is kind of awkward, to be honest. Um, the container sizes are really huge for these machine learning containers. They are around gigabytes, which is also, in my opinion, no, this is not a real container. Um, also, you can easily kind of touch and run the data as root, which is also not nice. And you s then you still have the another problem that the, uh, the NVIDIA driver and the CUDA library bleeds out of the container into the operating system. So you need to, to be current in the driver that the driver matches the container version. And this is also a thing which is kind of... Ah, you shouldn't do that. And also you needed, an for the GPU support for NVIDIA, you needed a, an additional container hook, which was not available for SUSE. When I did this, um, this should change. So it could be available now, but I did not check that. So I tried to use, uh, I used the Python, inter the, um, yeah, the, the virtual install with Python. Um, still, you have the same problem that you have to be very careful that you download the right CUDA version with the right driver version and then you eventually get this to working. You still have to set some library paths and things that they really match. Then these were the versions I used. Okay. Then why, um, what is Baxilla? We know all what Baxilla is. Um, we have a very structured data there. O on the one side, it's kind of of what arrow it is, it has a description, what level, um, and I was also hoping the assignment of the error, which means to w in which area the error occurred. And on the other hand, we have the unstructured data, which is the bug description, and my primary goal, or wha what I was really intended, was to, to just look at the summary of the bug and the first comment of the bug, which is the bug description, and see if um, a neural net or machine learning method could find out just from the text and the summary to which area the bug then was or, or was assigned. So that if a user um, makes a, or opens a new bug report, the, uh, the algorithm could tell them, oh, see, from the text, I would assume this is this and that area. So um, that was my intention. Um, for that, uh, I had to. Yeah. Yeah, okay, then the Susie box. For that, I had to first really look into the our um, Baxilla and uh, uh, setup. Um, the thing is, it's a relatively complicated, non-trivial setup, like it's described on other things. So you could not use the standard RPs to really access it. Um, I found a the Python Baxilla package where you could search for bugs or or you, where you could kind of get a box and then get it into Python, which is a big advantage because when you are in Python, because all the machine learning 
libraries are also in Python, so you do not have to intermix languages. Um, I also only use the pub public available bugs because um, so I do not read so I do not get any confidential information out of SUSE. Um, yet the problem is the front end is really very slow, so I did not get that many bugs out in the time I just tried to. Um, there is fast, uh, fastzilla.suse.de, um, but there we have the problem, or I have the problem, that there um, we um, that there you could access all, also the confidential box, and so there's easy the possibility to spread out information which should not be spread out. So my results was from from the script which ran then for I think two hours or something. I found about uh, four thousand usable bugs. Um, interestingly, for finding these four thousand bugs, I had to grab uh, I, I just the the script just um, um, got a very uh, started with a bug number and then just uh, um, g got the number down and looked at if is if the bug is available or not. And that was my first really interesting result, but which, which was surprising for me, that just 20% of the bug in the Bugzilla database are open. So the rest are kind of really L3 support bugs and other things. Um, I also could not really determine from the, the, that's kind of no clear field, which could determine on which area the bug then was solved. That is a bit of shortcoming. Um, perhaps I, this could be improved, like for grabbing an email address where it was assigned to, or perhaps grabbing out a package which was resolved, perhaps connecting this a bit to OBS. Um, and also the severity of the bug could change, so I was not kind of sure which um, severity of the bug I could use. Um, so I, my, the things that I was used to, to was um, the, the numbers I was using was then the number of comments, which means that if the, the, the machine learning algorithm should try to guess from the bug summary and the first bug, uh, um, the first also from the from the opening of the bug, how many comments there will likely to be, and also how long it would take that this bug is kind of resolved. And that's all from the last point, which is the summary in the first comment, which is the bug report itself. So that's the thing, um, just an example how the data is structured. Yeah, and then uh, in order to feed this into Keras, which is a kind of front end to TensorFlow, you had to use some tools. You have to map the text to a dictionary. Then you have to kind of clarify the data that it's in the same um, dimension, that all the bug reports are kind of uh, have the same length so that you can feed them into a neural net. And um, yeah, there are so this kind of tools, you, but you have to look up how they work and what you can do with them. And also, then you have to split up the data in a training model and a test sample. Yeah, that's kind of the now a distribution of the length of the bug plus the first. So the length of a bug report, it's kind of a normal distribution, which I would really ex have expected. And then also the number of his, uh, histogram of the number of comments, which means we have s the most bugs don't have just one res or just have one response, and that's all. But some are really have really um, it must be one or two really have a lot of responses and comments in it, and this is more like a one through x distribution. Um, and then I was. Just wanted to see oh, if the if 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 the bug report is just very long, does it provoke a long number of comments? So you can plot this two against, and then you see no, there's no really relation. If there were to be a relation, you would see uh, a straight line somewhere. Yeah, and then that's kind of just a description how I set up my model, which is just some Python code. Yeah, and that's the result, the training result. I could not train anything. Um, I think the main problem here is that, uh, that I just gathered too less data. Yeah. So the next time I will try to get all, if I find some time, I will try to get more data out of Bugzilla um, because um, my script, which 
um, pulls out the data of Boxilla is just um, getting them one error number or bug number, and you could um, get several uh, bug reports at once with one request. So this should speed up the, the, the speed of how I can get the data out of Boxilla. Okay, thank you. And fantastically enough, that was 10 seconds shy of your goal of 10 minutes. You couldn't have timed it more perfectly. Can, can I ask us, uh, well, make a comment? No, no, no comment. No, 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 no comment. Is it about the format? No, about uh, the 20% you mentioned. Speak to him afterwards. Yeah. Okay. So next we have Anna Maresova, who's the team lead of the Labs Project Managers. Yeah, exactly. Hi, I'm Anna, and I'm a unicorn. You know what are unicorns? Those are animals that you have probably never seen, yeah? And that's why this is a term that's being used for female hackers. There is even a thing that's called unicorn law that states that any female hacker will ultimately end up talking about female hackers. But I am very happy to do it here for, uh, for you now and I would like to share with you my story. When I joined Prague SUSE office in 2004, I was the only female hacker there and alone for quite some time. And I was quite sad about that because you know, it's nice to be with all of you, but <laughs> there are just things that you can uh, enjoy only with other females, like talking about design of the best machine for shaving the legs or a software for prediction of the period or tips and tricks how to date other hackers, and a lot of other stuff, yeah? So I tried my best to bring more female hackers there, but that proved to be quite difficult. I managed to get there only one. Well, if you remember your school years, if you have studied computer science, how many females did you have there? I had two more, actually. And they were not even that interested in talking to me because they were dating each other, dating each other anyway. <laughs> but, <laughs> I managed, and when this pulled right out, I started to teach computer science and programming my non-technical friends. It was quite easy to motivate them because, you know, it's difficult to get a decent job with a good wage and working part-time if you are female in this country. I don't know how it's in other countries. And some of them proved to be quite capable, and one of them even recently got a job in a computer, s computer company. Not Susa, because she didn't really get that far yet. We are usually hiring only the best ones, right? But I hope that she will grow up and you will meet her here in quite some years. Anyway, uh, as I am introverted nerd like most of you. I do not have that many friends. Uh, and so what to do now? I could just get give up, but uh, we have, I don't know, five female hackers in Prague office. We have much more females in other, uh, other functions, of course, but not that much engineers. So. And so I'm actually very happy that with all the support we are getting now with our top management, we could probably do something much better together. And I believe that this is something we should do because any team lead amongst you probably have an idea how it's difficult at the moment to hire any decent applicant, yeah? So why not to make the pool larger? Why not to include the other half of the mankind, basically? I could see that my friends could do it. You just had to explain them. And so maybe you could try to join me to discuss what we can do, how we can approach them, how we could educate them. I even started a new mailing list on Mailman called Women in Tech, and I would be very happy to meet all of you there. And to help me to make a world where there are no more unicorns, where only female, hack uh, where are female hackers who have never talked about female hackers, because it's not a topic anymore, yeah? And so that's all I wanted to share with you, thanks. <laughs> Okay, next up we have William Brown, who's also on my team, works on um, directory services. All right, now. Normally I work on directory services, but that is not what I'm here to talk to you about today. I'm here to talk to you about history and politics of Australian and New Zealand supermarket chains and their subsequent mergers and rebrandings. This is Australia, and this is New Zealand. 
and we have supermarkets, believe it or not. Now, Australia has a supermarket duopoly. We have Coles and Woolworths, and New Zealand has a few major brands of its own, Countdown, New World, things like this. And how we got here through this history is actually quite a journey. In 1914, Coles was founded in Collingwood, Melbourne by Sir James Coles. In 1920, Foursquare was founded by John Barker in New Zealand. Foodstuffs Auckland was founded by the Masters Grocers Association to create a cooperative buying group. They expanded in 1925 with the introduction of Foursquare branding on members' stores. Well, Wellington decided that this model was working really well, so they made their own. Except it was separate. It has their own CEO, board of directors and everything else. Woolworths Bazaar was founded in New South Wales because it, and it was named this to avoid issues with American Woolworths. After discovering that Woolworths America had no intent to expand to Australia, they renamed to Woolworths Stupendous Bargain Basement. And this was followed by rapid expansion to most states of Australia. Foodstuffs Christchurch was now formed, again independent of the other two. And in 1930, Frank Lindstrom made a supermarket and quickly sold it in his first year to Woolworths. Woolworths in 1940 now has a state in every state of Australia after I think Hobart. I apologise to Perth for not being on the map. And then Frank Lindstrom comes back with Franklin's in New South Wales. Bill Pratt starts a supermarket chain in Victoria called Pratt's. And Dunedin opens their foodstuffs cooperative, making it the fourth in New Zealand. Progressive Enterprises is founded by the Pico family. They aren't a supermarket, but we'll come back to them later. Rolf Voss turns milk, his milk bar into a market in 1958. At this point, Coles decides to buy all of Dickens, which is a store I hadn't mentioned because they just got bought by Coles. Food Town is created in Otahuhu in Auckland, and a supermarket called Bilby's in South Australia is again eaten by Coles. 1960, Coles then follows up by buying all of Matthew Thompson's in New South Wales, and Progressive Enterprises in Australia becomes the parent of Food Town New Zealand. Coles rebrands to New World and has no relation to New World in New Zealand, and at this point, America finally decides to invade our country, and they bring Safeway. And they buy all three of Pratt's supermarkets in Victoria. New World is founded in New Zealand as part of Foodstuffs, which has no relation to Coles New World, and Action Supermarkets is founded in 1970 in Perth. In 1979, Bilo is founded in South Australia, and Countdown launched in New Zealand in 1981 as part of Rat Ray's Wholesale. Franklin's, Franklin's finally opens in Victoria, and Woolworths acquires Ralph Voss and Purity in Tasmania. Franklin's now opens in Queensland, and at this point, Safeway owns 126 locations in Victoria, Queensland, New South Wales, but where in New South Wales it's known as Red S due to a trademark violation with Saveway. Pack and Save is founded in New Zealand as an imitation of Safeway, and Woolworths begins to acquire Safeway, rebranding New South Wales and Queensland, but not Victoria, where it's still called Safeway. Coles buys the Progressive Enterprises, which means they now own New Zealand's food town, and Franklin's finally opens in South Australia and ACT. In 1990, the most fashionable decade, Coles New World rebrands to Coles Supermarkets, and Coles Meyer divests from Progressive Enterprises, meaning that it is now independent again. PE still owns Food Town and Countdown. Coles rebrands simply to Coles, and in the year 2000, Rolf Voss and Purity start to begin to rebrand to Woolworths, except they forgot to change the tiles in the car park in the Hobart stores. Progressive Enterprises buys Woolworths in New Zealand, and Woolworths Australia now purchases Progressive Enterprises. Action then buy is bought out by Woolworths in Perth, and Coles buys Bilo in South Australia, leading to hilarity such as Ingle Farm, where there, which now has two Coles within 50 metres of each other because one was a Bilo and one was a Coles. They still both exist to this day, and if you stand in the middle, you can still see them. Legend tells that Victoria also has their own double Coles. Find your own. PE Progressive Enterprises announced that all Food Town and Woolworths will rebrand to Countdown, not Woolworths, despite their parent company, meaning that residents are confused when this overnight turns into this. In 2010, all the Franklin stores become IGAs, and Food Town at Browns Bay is the last one rebranded to Countdown in 2011. Foodstuff Auckland and Wellington merge to be under the name Foodstuff North Island and sef separate to Foodstuff South Island, which is a merger between Dunedin and Christchurch. And in 2013, Woolworths starts nearly completes rebranding to Safeway to Woolworths in Victoria, except for the final Safeway in Wodonga, which was re finally rebranded in 2017. And it's 2019 now, and that's how we got here. Got here, 105 years and 17 different businesses, eventually becoming six-ish. Oh, and by the way, a store called Big Fresh in New Zealand had animatronic vegetables when you walked in. Boy, take the view.
Right. Um, a while ago, I was talking to an analyst about that we make operating systems, and the analyst told me, but operating systems, aren't they a commodity? You know, like coal? So you can buy them from anybody, and you can just replace one with the other. And I was like, okay, yeah, you're kind of right. I mean, rails, less, it's, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. But we are trying to differentiate, right? And so I was thinking about how much do we actually really differentiate. And I figured out that for the last couple of years, the main differentiating point where we tried hard was the part which we are paid for. Well, that's kind of logical, right? You try to improve uh, the stuff that, com that customers like to pay you for, and that is support, support maintenance. And we are known for very excellent support. Um, so we have succeeded in there. We have also invested a lot of in hardening QA to actually, well, reduce the number of support cases that we had then then have to deliver, and we have also excelled at that. Now, did that leave a blind spot or not? And, well, figuring out how do other companies sell, operating, uh, sell, sell software? And the answer is, well, they are trying to make the software better. And we do that only to a limited degree because we are an open source. We have a limited amount of what we can invest into the actual software to improve it. We have done quite a bit, and we have been very successful with that. But have we been really looking at what actually today, in today's environment, makes people choose which operating system they'll use? Or will they do it just like they would do with coal um, based on pricing? And in many, many cases, it is in pricing, sure. Uh, and we have succeeded in very good deals based on pricing. But maybe we should take a look at what makes uh, the customer want a particular version. And in the end, that always translates to ease of use. That always translates into um, when the customer or a user, it doesn't have to be commercial, uh, installs our product, our operating system, do they think, OK, well, that's actually pretty cool. They have thought about my use case. This was very simple, right? So that's something that, that, that we need to think about. And that's actually something that we are starting to think about deeper with the developer program that uh, Marco, who is not right now here, is, is spearheading inside the company, trying to uh, look at what individual groups of developers are doing with the operating system, what they need to be able to do their job, what is missing in the operating system, and what we need to add. Now, that's great, and we certainly need to continue there um, because Developers, there is, I don't know, the last census was like there's 28 million of software developers in the world. That's a sizable population. Uh, but they are not the only ones. Um, although today they actually do control quite a bit of uh, the purchasing decisions based on new DevOps models and so on. There are more things that have changed compared to when Linux has started and when the standard distro model has started. Uh, and that is mainly uh, the transition to public cloud, hyperconverged as they call it today, and to edge. And we will need to think quite deeply what we need to do with the OS to make it easily deployable, such that really somebody goes, takes it, and say, oh wow, this, I this fits my user scenario pretty well. Somebody has thought ahead of that. Uh, and we need to take a look at what other gaps we have in an operating system, such that we not only provide the best service, but we also provide a good reason why people should choose us. Um, and that actually pretty much concludes my talk with a call to action. If you have experience with a particular use case for the OS, and there are things that bother you in there, that you say, okay, this is quite clumsy, this piece is missing, or, well, I hate how this is done. Well, we should do something about that and we should improve the operating system. And, and the only option to do that is not the hack week. We can actually do it all the time. And so opening new features has been available to everybody, but that doesn't always work that great. Uh, so they get forgotten. So yes, do open new features, but also talk to your team lead directors, product managers. Uh, we have a whole new inbound organization and try to, con the ease, and try to convince them that this is the way, uh, this is what we should do. Uh, and we will listen. Thank you.
And likewise, with exactly 10 seconds left. <laughs> so if now it, that you've seen it, is anybody, did you think of an idea? Because we have a few minutes. We can certainly do another talk if somebody has something they'd like to talk about. OK, well, then that, will, that concludes our lightning talks. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to keep. I'm